Wow, it's been a while since we did one of these, huh? Okay then. <clears throat> Comics are weird. The comic book publishing industry has about the same relationship to intellectual property copyright management that Republicans have to governing. They don't really believe in it, they're terrible at doing it, but they keep trying even though every time they do, they f Anyway, what follows is the story of several connected stories that, taken as a whole, make up perhaps the most absurd IP infighting ripple effect in industry history. Buckle up. Okay, Dateline 1939. Fawcett Comics writer Bill Parker and artist C.C. Beck create a new superhero with the ingenious secret identity of an ordinary little kid who transforms into a full-blown adult-sized hero when he says the magic word Shazam. They name their hero Captain Marvel, and he becomes one of the most popular superhero characters of the Golden Age, eventually eclipsing even Superman himself in popularity for much of the 1940s. But in 1948, DC, then called National Comics, sued Fawcett Fawcett alleging that Captain Marvel was too similar to Superman, and in a legal decision that probably would not be decided the same way today, the presiding judge agreed with DC, and despite some nuance reached on appeal, by 1951, Fawcett had shuttered its superhero division and ceased publication of what was still an enormously popular character. In fact, Captain Marvel's popularity had extended all the way overseas to the United Kingdom, where black and white reprints of the American comics, which couldn't be imported as is due to eccentricities in UK import laws of the time, were still selling big numbers for British publisher Len Miller, so to keep the well from drying up, said publisher had writer Mick Anglo create a different enough newish hero with basically the same powers and backstory named Marvel Man to continue the line. And score one for British ingenuity. It worked. Marvel Man comics sold successfully for about a decade, even as most other superhero characters went out of fashion. Until they changed that import law, and new full-color American comics flooded the market and put that line out of business by the mid-60s. Meanwhile, back in the United States, one-time third string of Timely Comics had changed their name to Marvel Comics, maybe you've heard of them, they've had a good last couple of years, and made a bunch of money basically by saying, sure, let's give it a shot to whatever crazy idea Stan Lee and or Jack Kirby and or several other guys came up with, and in 1967 one such idea was, hey, since no one has touched the license on the name Captain Marvel for years since Fawcett isn't allowed to publish the character, we should grab it up while it's lapped since, hey, we're called Marvel and all that. So they created a new Marvel-branded Captain Marvel, actually an alien warrior named Marvel, and then kept that title in constant publication, even though Marvel was never actually very popular until they gave the name to the former Miss Marvel Carol Danvers in the early 2000s, so that even when DC bought the rights to what was left of Fawcett and decided to revive the original Captain Marvel as part of their superhero universe in 1973, they weren't allowed to use his actual name other than in dialogue and had to market all subsequent books and merchandise as Shazam instead, which would remain the status quo until 2011 when they'd officially change his name to Shazam as part of the New 52 relaunch. Anyway, back across the pond in 1982, just shy of a decade after DC had revived the OG Captain Marvel, an anthology publisher Warrior Comics decided to launch an 80s-style dark and gritty reboot of the Marvel Man franchise written by Alan Moore, who counted Mick Anglo's original series as one of his formative influences, and let's face it, this is a story about people fucking each other over in the comic book business over copyright, so you're not the least bit surprised he's caught up in it somewhere. In any case, the Marvel Man reboot was basically where Moore first really dug in on the dark superhero genre deconstruction motif that would not only define the first wave of his career, but also serve as a template for other writers going forward, and it was a big, big, big hit for 21 issues until Moore walked away from the project because of financial disagreements, ending his run mid-story on a major cliffhanger. To continue making a profit off the material they did have, Warrior licensed US publisher Eclipse Comics to produce fully colored reprints, Warrior was in black and white like a lot of adults doing UK books of the era, of Moore's Marvel Man comics for the American market, where it had to be retitled Miracle Man in order to avoid copyright issues of a whole new kind with the famously litigious then-owners of Marvel, who were getting a reputation for being really difficult to work with at the time, that's going to be important, keep it in your brain. In any case, Miracle Man was just as big a hit, if not bigger, in the States than it had been in its homeland as Marvel Man, so Eclipse did not want to stop publishing it, even though they ran out of Alan Moore material. Enter Neil Gaiman. Yes, that one. In 1988, apparently with Alan Moore's tacit blessing, Gaiman took over a Miracle Man continuation for Eclipse, taking the character in an even more bizarre and dystopian direction that ran to respectable success of its own until Eclipse ran out of money in 1994 and the whole company folded, with its assets later being purchased at auction in 1996 by then Image Comics powerhouse and Spawn creator Todd McFarlane. Remember him? He used to be a thing. However, while the Eclipse assets allegedly included some of the IP rights to certain aspects of the Miracle Man slash Marvel Man franchise in the US, since Eclipse had initially only published reprints, it didn't include all of them. This whole next part, by the way, is very confusing and involves a lot of hearsay and legal bullshit, so if you want a more complete summary, go read that. But basically, it appeared that ownership of a Marvel Man as a property had divided up over the years piecemeal style between Gaiman, Mick Anglo, Alan Moore, several other writers and artists involved over the years, and apparently as of 1996, also Todd McFarlane. And this, believe it or not, is where things get nuts. Because what Todd McFarlane also did in 1996 was get into a 15 plus year war of back and forth legal battles with Neil Gaiman. Yeah. 
So remember that thing about Marvel Comics bosses being kind of crummy to work for in the late 80s, early 90s from a little while ago? Well, that kind of thing helped drive several big-named artists away from the company to found Image Comics in 1992 with a heavy focus on creators' rights in their original business plan. Specifically, if you created a character in an Image comic, it would be yours, even if you did so in the context of another creator's series. Case in point, McFarlane brought in several high-profile writers to work on early issues of Spawn, including Frank Miller, Alan Moore, David Sim, and Neil Gaiman, who wrote Spawn number 9 and in doing so introduced the characters of medieval spawn Cagliostro and a sexy demon hunting lady warrior angel named Angela, who for obvious reasons got a lot of merchandise attention when McFarlane parlayed spawn into what turned out to be his ultimate career path high priced action figures. Straight from the comic book, get spawn! It's spawn! Vertebrator! Spawn, look out! Battling evildoers everywhere! Go, spawn! Live the adventure! However, per what were supposed to be the rules of freelancing for Image Comics, were supposed to belong to Neil Gaiman, but when he came looking to collect, McFarlane allegedly said some variation on not so fast, and out came the lawyers. Originally, McFarlane proposed a trade-off whereby he'd keep Angela and the characters in exchange for handing over his piece of the Miracle Man rights to Gaiman, who he knew had been working hard to secure full rights to the property so he could in some way finish his original story. Most of the other rights holders had been happy to either sell or even just hand theirs over, but McFarlane seemed set on using it as a bargaining chip, and in the subsequent legal challenge, he seemed to change his mind and instead argued that he shouldn't have to give Gaiman anything because the characters he created in Spawn were not original enough to count. Once again, this is Todd McFarlane accusing Neil Gaiman of not being an original enough writer. That's a thing that happened. And not only did he lose that case, he lost a subsequent case based around quote-unquote new Spawn characters created to replace the disputed ones, where a presiding judge made a point of noting that the origins for these replacements violated McFarlane's own established rules for the Spawn universe continuity. That's a burn. The fight raged across the comics industry gossip spots for a big chunk of the early 2000s, with Gaiman ultimately ending up owning Angela full stop and McFarlane, not the most popular dude among his industry peers at this point, if you can't guess, even attempting to register Miracle Man trademarks of his own and adding a mysterious character named the Man of Miracles to the Spawn universe, seemingly just to be petty about it. Meanwhile, Gaiman, who is really popular and well-liked dude among his industry peers, had formed a limited liability company along with Marvel Comics, hey, there they are again, and arranged for the proceeds from Gaiman's 2002 alternate universe miniseries 1602 to go into it, the purpose of which was to acquire the remainder of the Marvel Man, Miracle Man, and whatever other rights needed to be got in order for Marvel to claim publication rights to the franchise, issue new collections of the originals and the reboots, and let Gaiman and artist Mark Buckingham finally finish the story they'd wanted to in the first place. Eventually, McFarlane's villain role in all of this kind of sputtered out when he was sued into bankruptcy by a hockey player for allegedly naming a Spawn character after him without permission, really, and it was ultimately revealed that he'd never actually ended up owning any of the Miracle Man stuff to begin with. He'd basically been bargaining with an empty hand. In the end, Marvel Comics did end up owning Marvel Man's rights and began republishing the Moore and Gaiman Miracle Man material as of 2014, with Gaiman and Buckingham's long-awaiting concluding story still currently in development as of July of this year, with Marvel promising it will be out when it comes out. Oh, and for one last bit of character copyright nonsense to top the whole saga off, in what's widely viewed as a final bit of mic drop payback against McFarlane, Farland, Gaiman gave Angela to Marvel 2, whereas of 2015, she's been fully integrated into the Marvel Comics universe with a new retconned origin story as Thor's long-lost sister, a new love interest in fellow ex-angel Sarah, who technically is believed to be Marvel's first acknowledged transgender character, how about that? And even a guest spot on the Guardians of the Galaxy cartoon. And that, folks, is several things that all happened in connection to one another on kind of the same theme. Yep. I, look, I said it was weird. I didn't say it was going to add up to some kind of big overarching message. But it sure is interesting, right? Hey gang, here's a question that keeps coming up. If your handle is Movie Bob, where are your movie reviews? Well, my old reviews are in a lot of places. You'll find many of them on my YouTube channel, but you'll find the brand new ones on Geek.com, an awesome site that's also your one-stop news source for science, TV, gaming, technology, nerd culture, the works. You can find all my reviews directly by going to Geek.com slash author slash B. Chapman, because that's my real name, and you can get regular updates on all my reviews and all of Geek.com's other great content by signing up for their kick-ass newsletter at subscribe.geek.com. 
And don't forget to also subscribe to the Geek.com YouTube channel, where you'll find the videos that accompany my reviews and tons of other great content, too. Remember, that's Geek.com, the Geek.com newsletter, and Geek.com on YouTube. Make sure you don't miss out on all the latest Movie Bob reviews. You can also check out my own new website, Movie Bob Central, where you'll find my blog, links to all my work, and shop for my books, ebooks, and future Movie Bob products. And please remember to like these videos, share them with all of your friends, and subscribe to this channel. Thank you for watching another Movie Bob production.